I thought everyone was going to dress up. No. No. <sighs> Although I will say, of all the German <laughs> costumes you could wear, yeah, that could have gone real bad. The modern rogue has a basic understanding of German beers. Back again with the beerists. The first time they taught us to understand beer, this time we're gonna learn the nuances of German beer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Germany's got a really rich brewing tradition. And when people think about beer in America, a lot of times they think about German, Belgian, and English styles. When it comes to imports, when it comes to stuff that has a lot more character than the you know, light American lagers that people grew up with. So think about everything you know about German beer. What are the core tenets? The moment you sip it, whether you are familiar with it or not, you're like, this feels like a German beer to me. What is it you're looking for? Certain things will pop out about different styles that sing Germany to me, but one of the core things about German brewing is that they were under this thing called the Reinheitsgebot for a really long time we, still. All right, we talked about this. This is the German purity law, right? Yes, yes. Okay. And dictating what ingredients you can use in particular beers. It's gonna be one water, malt, hops, and then yeast, which they didn't know about initially when they made this law, but then later got added on because it's pretty necessary. Yeah, of course. Right. You're gonna get a lot of different flavor profiles out of those core four ingredients. If this is anything like last time we went on a flight, uh, expect us to get a little bit loose by the end. Actually, let's just start tasting. You make a very compelling okay. argument, officer. <laughs> We're gonna start off with this Reisdorf Kolsch. And this style, the Kolsch style, yeah. arose around the time when Bohemian brewers, you know, what's now modern day Czech Republic, started brewing these much lighter and more drinkable styles. I, and I was about to say, this is the closest to the, you know, the American Miller Coors experience uh, from what I'm seeing here, right? Is well, there something I should be on the lookout for? When, when it arose, it was more close to like the lagers that they were brewing in Bohemia and they didn't have the same yeasts or methods in Cologne, Germany, where this style originated. They were using warm fermenting ale yeasts. Now is our chance to shine. Is How it? much do you remember? First thing you do is examine what? Oh, oh yeah, the color. The color, right? You can yeah. see it's a it's a clear beer. Uh, looks like a lager. You said this is a it lager? It looks like a lager. This it's is a, a hybrid Kolsch. style. Okay, yeah. okay. So a Kolsch is using ale yeast, but they are cold conditioning it afterwards. In the 80s, they switched the uh, recipe to new Kolsch, and it didn't go over very well. What? No, that's not a thing. <laughs> that's not a thing. You're thinking about Kolsch. Oh, <laughs> new Kolsch. <laughs> So step one is the color, right? Step and as you notice, it's really clear yeah. and beautifully golden. And second is the nose, yeah. right? And one thing about the color is at the time when this style was first coming to, to be, the beers that they were drinking in Cologne, Germany were all sort of darker, sort of murkier ales. So everything that they were doing in Bohemia was a lot clearer, a lot lighter. The young folks were drinking a lot of those beers and they were kind of taking over the local market. So in order to fight against that, the brewers in Cologne started brewing this style of beer, which takes a lot of the same cues as the lagers they were making in Bohemia, but then their cold conditioning, which resulted in the cleaner, clearer beer. Cold conditioning, that's just the artifact of the environment. It just happens to be cold and then that's why. It's the aging of the beer. After you ferment it, you condition it, you let it sit for a while and let the flavors develop. Let the what? yeast start eating the sugars in the beer and start to break it down. So what time period are we talking We're right talking here? about 1700, 16 to 1800s. Am I wrong there? Yeah, that's a real big spread. Yeah. We're talking about the late 1800s. So how far away were these two regions, Cologne versus uh, Bohemia? They're pretty close by. Okay. Close enough to, you know, export to one another. Okay, okay. so on the nose, I, the first thing I thought was grass clippings for some reason. Does mm -hmm. that make Perfect. sense to you guys? Do you, yes. you, you feel that? So it does, it, it feels fresh and springtimey. It feels, I, I don't know how it'll taste, but it seems like it'll be refreshing. And that's coming from the traditional German hops that they're using in here. A lot of those tend to be sort of grassy and floral. If I was gonna ask at a bar, obviously this is one particular brand, but would I say, give me a Kolsch? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I needed to hear. Yeah, it's kind of a mixed bag of what you'll get there because Kolsch, is actually an appellation, sort of like champagne. You can't call a champagne a champagne if it's not from the Champagne region. Oh, gotcha. It's sparkling wine. Yeah. All proper Kolsch's are made in and around Cologne. There's about 20 breweries, give or take, that are making Kolsch for realsies. So can they not legally call it a Kolsch if it's not brewed from there? Correct, but the loophole is that American brewers that are making Kolsch beers are making Kolsch style beers. They're yeah, calling them Kolsch style. 
addition add, add there. the style. Step three is the taste, yes. right? And it's a really pleasant drink. It's very, very refreshing. Yeah, really light refreshing. Yeah. It's smooth, it knocks back cleanly. It's not really dry on the finish. It just feels refreshing. Yeah, for the, the, style, the style goes from four and a half to 5%, you know, so it's always sort of this thing that you can drink for most of the day and not get too crap faced. When you taste it, do you taste um, kind of like like breaded shrimp for some reason pops into my mind? Like like a, like a cracker bread or yeah, oh, oyster get crackers, right? The breading idea and like a light bread, like a cracker, like yeah. an oyster cracker, yeah, yeah, yeah. is definitely gonna be in there. It's yeah. bready notes and grassy notes are gonna be really rich in this So beer. some cultures have a measure of wheat in the grain bill. But most of what the grain is in here is Pilsner malt, which tastes kind of like crackers. Yeah. Oh, and the fourth one was uh, the, the the after, the, the finish, the is finish. that what it was called? Yeah, yeah not, not like super dry, but you can still, it has a, just a slight aftertaste, but not an unpleasant one. It's like a roommate that figured out that he overstayed his welcome. He was like, peace out, I'm out. Mm. Yeah, this beer is supposed to be a dry, drinkable, anytime beer. That's, I think, perfect for the summertime. Yeah, this is uh, really light, and it just feels very refreshing. There's an almost, uh, I don't know, sweetness in the in the upfront that that you get uh, that vanishes very quickly with the dry. Uh, man, that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah, and Reisdorf is an amazing Kolsch brewer, and they've been around since the late 1800s and since then have been owned and operated by the same family. So Holy cow. there's a hell of a pedigree in this brand. Now we've got people watching from all over the world. If you're in America, what's the best place to go and get this? Oh, good beer bottle shops, you know, gourmet grocery stores. Some will have these and I suggest the ones in the cans. It's not available everywhere, but it's not necessarily difficult to track. Down. Correct. This is a lot more accessible and us being in Austin, Texas, we made a real point of trying to get German beers here but our accessibility is gonna be limited. So we tried to find a good brewery that represented particular styles. All right, this next beer is 1809. This is from Professor Fritz Bream, and he brewed this out of Munich. This guy is apparently a professor who has studied a lot of the history of particular beers from the past, and then tried to mimic the styles and resurrect them in a certain way. Is 1809 a year or? 18 I, mean, I know, yes, there was a year called 1809. <laughs> yeah. but, it was, but it was right after 1808, actually. actually. All right, but, but yeah. is that what he's trying to capture? Absolutely, 1809 is a particular year where Napoleon came up, conquered the Prussians, and they came over and tried this Berliner Weiss, had championed it as the champagne of the North. Well, actually, that year he toasted with his army and their victory against the Prussians. That was the year that they did that. What's a Berliner Weiss? So a Berliner Weiss can have up to 50% wheat. It's a lightly tart wheat beer that is absolutely a joy to drink. It's really refreshing, slightly fruity. Fantastic for the summertime. Mm -hmm. Typically they're about 3% beer, but this is a 5%. This is a little right. bit more robust. This is a bit bigger because this beer is made for the US market. It's made specifically for export. I'm not sure if it's available in Europe. I know that it wasn't for a really long time. Well, I'll tell you this much, as far as I could tell, the color is clear. Uh, it looks almost identical to the previous one. It really depends on where in the bottle you get Holy your Holy cow, pour. yours oh, is yours so is so we, get, wow. we got our pours closer to the end. My goodness, look the at the difference there. Yeah. That's incredible. So you can get some stratification in the bottle. That looks more like a wheat beer. Right. That looks like he just yeah. poured wheat this into This is a it. beer that we could have mixed up in the bottle, turned it on its side, and rolled it, and had a little bit more of a balance. So we can also taste the difference now between that one and this glass. Really? So from your perspective, I would imagine that it's like dealer's choice. Do you want to take something like this and get it consistent by pouring it around, or do you want to understand that the first few sips will be very different from the last few sips? A general rule of thumb is that you want to pour up until about a 16th to an eighth left in the bottle, and then you can take that and pour it in at the end to agitate all the beers, or you can roll it and mix all of it up front. But that's not unheard of to try to get a consistent uh, taste throughout all of them. Right, generally, if it's not a Hefeweizen, you don't want to pour the yeast in with the beer. Really? Yeah, generally. Because, I mean, with Hefeweizens, it's a big flavor component. I only know it by 1809, but this is what type of beer? It's a Berliner Weiss. Berliner Weiss, got yes. it. So... So these beers were really popular, or sort of arose in popularity in Berlin. You don't say. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's really sure. By a sure. guy working at a Weiss. Right. <laughs> he said, I'm the Berliner Weiss. <laughs> no. Nobody's really sure how this style arose. There are a few competing theories. One is, you know, there were these French immigrants coming through Flanders, learning how they there made these 
tart red and brown beers and sort of applied those methodologies to making this beer. There's another one where it was a copy of a copy of another beer that was really popular in, uh, in the 1600s. And really, we don't know very much about the origins of this beer. Kind of like folklore, you have all sorts of people contributing and taking and applying to their own and synthesizing and so forth. And so after a couple of decades, uh, the original origins are lost to history. Right, but what we do know is that like I said, it's a lightly tart beer with a little bit of an acidity there. You can detect it even in the nose. Like yeah. uh, the, the, the clarity uh, varied between our pores, but I bet in the nose, you can smell uh, a little uh, nine volt battery coming your way. Well, see what's cool about this is that the acidity comes from lactic acid. That's the same sort of acid that you find in sourdough bread, in yogurt, and in sauerkraut. And awesome. that tells you a little what to expect with this one. Sure. All right, here we go. And, you know, I'm also getting a little bit of a fruity sort mm -hmm. of lemony peach aroma, too. Yeah. A little bit of Greek yogurt, that sourness. It's got a bite to it. It's way more sour than I anticipated. Do you ever have little bites of synesthesia attack you? Oh, sure. Like, 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 um, like the first thought that came out of nowhere was uh, too yellow, <laughs> which makes no sense. But, but I mean, right. it, it's almost like I'm drinking straight lemon juice to my palate. It's very lemony. You know, when you're tasting beer, a lot of times your first sip of something will be a little shocking. Your second and third sips will be a little bit better because you know what to expect. And we experienced that last time with both of you guys. There was oh, stuff absolutely. that I hated that I ended up loving by the end. You and I think this might be one of them. Yeah. This isn't something that's going to quench your thirst, I don't think. Even though it is very lemony, it's a little too acidic in its lemoniness. I'll tell you what though, it is something that if I knew I wanted to start and make last an entire hour as I'm out on like a porch swing or something, I could totally see this working for that. But again, one thing to consider is that this isn't a traditional Berliner Weiss. This is a little bit higher in al alcohol, so it also has a lot more malt in it. It's a thicker beer than this style normally is. This style is usually lighter and crisper and way more drinkable than this. It, I don't know, I kind of adore how how just harsh the, the, the electricity is. Originally, it wasn't intentionally tart. A lot of beers at the time were kind of acidic because at the time they didn't know what yeast did. Whatever was in the air, whatever was on the grain, whatever was in their brewing equipment naturally is the thing that inoculated the beer. So there were a lot of accidents that ended oh, yeah. up becoming staples in beer production. Yeah, beer was absolutely an experimentation for so long. And then once they were able to nail down that it was lactobacillus, that was a huge component of this. The they souring to, part, yeah. They were able to purposefully put that in to the beer and sort of make a more consistent brewing process. It's a really good beer. I love this style quite a lot. And for me, during the summertime also, more traditional versions of this style is fantastic because it drinks like a Gatorade. How are we on availability for these? I know they brew it specifically for export, or at least they used to, so I'm not sure if it, you're in Europe, you can get this beer, but folks in America can find this pretty easily. You probably need to go to like some sort of specialty shop, yes. though. You won't be able to find it at like a convenience store or something. Oh, like not that. your general gas station beer. Yeah. So the next one is a Hefeweizen. This is from Eyinger. Yes. This is Eyinger Brauweiss, which is a Hefeweizen, and it's 5.1% from Eying, Germany, and it's a delicious Hefeweizen. Hefeweizens are actually my favorite. Yeah, they're wheat beers, usually comprised of 50 to 70% wheat in the grain bill. The rest Thank of you. it is Pilsner. And the name Hefeweizen comes from Weizen, which is wheat, mm -hmm. and then Hefe, which is yeast. Oh. So you hear like a crystal Weizen, that means crystal or clear wheat beer, and then this is gonna be a yeasty one. I have never known beer. that. And in Bavaria, this is actually called a Weiss beer, which means white beer. So Eyinger Brauweiss is, like I said, a wheat beer. They're using somewhere above 50%, usually from 50 to 70% wheat in the grain bill here. The rest of it's Pilsner, and it is defined mainly by the yeast character that is present in this beer. Like, you want the yeast in this beer. If you notice, cloudy. It's cloudy. Yeah, and unlike the previous one, well, we all appear to be pretty close in cloudiness yeah. here, right? And this one, you're gonna notice this clove flavor from the phenols in this beer. Phenols are a flavor oh, compound. Like, a, like, like an anise type flavor? Yeah, main, mainly clove, cinnamon, and maybe a little bit of anise. And then you'll also have other flavor components called esters, 
which are the more fruity sort of okay. flavors in here, flavors and aromas. That's why people generally say that uh, like Hefeweizens are more fruity beers, yeah. which is really a little too broad and unspecific. Well, and, and, and also like, you know, when you think of a Hefeweizen, that's the only beer most people can think of that you put a lemon wedge or an orange sure. wedge onto, right? But if you smell it the way it is, it's kind of like a creamy banana bread. Oh man, it smells so good. It's almost too intense for, for my taste. Really? There was, there was a time that I loved Hefeweizens a lot. Then I discovered IPAs and I realized how much more I enjoyed the bitter, dark flavors uh, than the light, fruity stuff. But because I'm a trooper, I'm gonna, don't worry. <laughs> God, you suffer so much for the show, man. You're I a real that, hero. I'm, I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> so if you smell it and you get a lot of that banana, that clove, you might be get a little bit of bubble gum as well. Yeah. In there. yeah. It's kind of creamy in texture when you drink it. And, well, it's... and, and the, the creaminess is, it never occurred to me until just now as we're talking that different beers will have different carbonation profiles. Because I noticed mm -hmm. that, that all of the carbonation is really is literally creamy. I mean, it's, it's a bunch of very tiny bubbles. Uh, there's a mouthfeel that is different from some of the other beers we've talked about. Yeah, and what's cool about that, same thing where it's adhering to the Ryan Heights component. There's four components to this beer, grain, water, hops, and yeast. And the vast differences just in these few beers that we've had so far yeah. that you can achieve from those four basic ingredients. You know, one thing that's cool about this beer also is that the popularity that it has now may not have actually happened if things had gone another way, because in the 50s, this beer style almost died completely. Really? Yeah, for some reason, it had this slow and steady decline. Nobody's really sure what happened, but in the mid 60s, it got a foothold, and now it makes up a third of the market share in the beers that they brew in Bavaria. Get out. Yeah. This is actually, again, my favorite type of beer. It's refreshing. I love it. I could drink this all night. What would you like to eat with this? Pretzels. Like, like, just no doubt, something, something uh, yes. uh, salty yeah. and robust, oh, yeah. right? I, I, I want, like, I, like the big breaded, yeah. hot. Buttery, pretzels. salty pretzels. Uh, yeah. You know what? Like 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 a, a bowl of cheese soup uh, in a bread bowl. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, like yeah. like oh, uh, yeah. super rich or that something. That would be like really that, good. Right? That is something that I have never previously taken the time to consider when placing an order anywhere. Normally it's like, well, I like this beer and I like this type of fish taco. Give me the two. And right. it never occurs to me like maybe there's another complimentary flavor that would make that more fun. Yeah, it's just like with cooking. You know, you wouldn't think that an apple would go well with cheese, but you put them together and they're delicious. It's the same thing with pairing beer with food. Is that, is that a true thing? Oh yeah. Oh, it's great, yeah. Yeah, okay. I yeah. always thought eating an apple with cheese would be disgusting. Like, See, what I are thought, you talking about? I felt the same way about when I dipped my McDonald's French fries into the, the milkshake. It's so good. Oh yeah, no, they're- So the reason those thing. things work is because you're contrasting flavors. Yeah. You know, if you think of flavors as a flavor wheel, for an apple, you have a little bit of tartness, a little bit of sweetness and fruitiness, and then you put cheese on it, which is salty and fat, and those things sort of lock together. So just so I lock it in, in Bavaria, this is a Weiss beer. Yes. Here in America, just say have a Weissen. Correct. Got it. This beer is very similar to the last one we had. This is a Dunkel Weissen, and it's called Julius Ector Weissbach Dunkel, and this is from Wurzburger Hofbrau. AG, and this is a Dunkelweizen, which is almost exactly the same as a Hefeweizen. It's considerably darker. Though. Yes, yeah. they're using some Vienna and Munich malts that are caramel or crystal, or even roasted malts that give it this beautiful darker color. So in general, is there a rule of thumb, like the darker the beer, the more you can expect a certain profile, or is this just a case of it just happens to be colored different? Well, the alcohol is actually pretty much the same. I think this is what, a 5.2%? This is 4.9. 4.9. So it's less. actually a little bit less. This predisposition that I have is that darker beers have a higher ABV, and that's completely incorrect. Completely incorrect. Both of these beers, the one we had before this and this one, average out at about four and a half to five and a half percent. Okay. The Dunkel translates to dark. So that's a dark wheat beer that we're having here. And what's going on is that they're taking the wheat grain that they have and they're running it through a kiln. So it gets a little cooked and that's what helps make it a little bit of a darker beer. Okay. But everything else is the same, like 50 to 70% wheat. And, and we should still expect notes of, uh, of, of, of citrusy, fruity, You're light. gonna taste a lot of the same stuff as the last beer, but in this beer, there's gonna be kind of toasty, roasty undertones. Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> this, this is more of that yin and yang that I've been looking yeah. for. Yeah, hey. And it looks a little- Oh, it's super dark. Kind of cola-like or iced tea colored. It's almost opaque. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
but smelling that is very similar to the last it's, beer. It's weird because it looks like a local favorite, like Shiner Bach, mm -hmm. uh, basic color. But then, uh, but then when you smell it, it uh, there's a crisp, uh, brash opening that really pops. It's got a little bit of like a, a toasty bread, yeah. you know, or a crusty. It doesn't wheat quite bread. have the acidity of the Hefeweizen. Right. This might be the smoothest, to my surprise, of all of the German beers you've presented so far. This one feels balanced. It does have a robustness. Maybe some of the roastingness offsets the brashness of the of the sour. I, I don't know. One thing that I learned about beers is that if you're drinking a certain type and then you follow it up with a different one, that can totally change the flavor profile, of course, of the other one. I was drinking a Hefeweizen like all night and then I had a much darker beer and I had that and it tasted like bubble gum, yeah. which isn't how it's usually supposed to taste but I loved it. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. It, it is so important to contextualize what you're drinking based on what you previously drank or ate and how your palate has been affected. Like that will dictate a lot of what you're drinking and how we structure a lot of our beer tastings based on the alcohol content or how aggressive a beer will be on our palate regardless of alcohol content, we want to generally move from something that's gonna be a lighter or less aggressive to, to the heavier stuff at the end. It's a style that hasn't really taken off quite as much. Uh, it's kind of in, in Bavaria considered an old people's drink. Dude, that means really? it's primed for uh, the Bay Area. Get ready for <laughs> Dunkelweissens. But I, I love this stuff. I'm really liking this because again, it doesn't have that sourness that can build up after you drink several Hefeweizens yeah. Yeah, and, and Hefe you just have to shift and gears. And just to clarify, Hefeweizen isn't really sour, but it has a mild acidity. It, yeah, it's that it's that citrusy that mm -hmm. you can only do so much of. Right. If there's one takeaway about a Dunkelweizen, what is it people should remember? It's kind of a Hefeweizen, but a little bit more oomphy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a Hefeweizen with sunglasses on. Kind of, like a, yes. a, a, a toasty Hefeweizen. It's a Hefeweizen with a tan. Oh, a Hefeweizen. I hate you. Get out. He's the guy wearing the later hosen. Let's wrap this up with the Doppelbach. This is from Andex Brewery. This is out of Foster. How do you say that? And this is actually a, what do you call it? A, a cloister. <laughs> cloister. Where to Christ? It's from Closter Brewery. None of those could be real words. From and I would have been a, like, on decks. Here's a double box. You just use a different Lock word than I was used to. Cluster, <laughs> yeah. cluster Job, Brewery Abbey on Road. decks. Is the brewery. Uh, the Foster Rito. Brewery on Dex. Which means God the monastic Cuckoo brewery Cuckoo. of on Dex. And the final beer that we are drinking is the Doppelbach. This is from on Dex Brewery out of on Dex, Germany. Yes, and this is actually a monastic beer. Monks make this out of Cluster Brewery on Dex. Now, when it says Doppelbach, that makes me feel like it's a double Bach. However much Bach a regular Bach is, it's twice it's like as much. Twice as the box, Twi yeah. twice box. Yes. Box are these really malty lagers. A Doppelbach is just a really strong Bach. Most people, the first time they ever hear about a Bach beer is gonna be like a Texas's own Shiner Bach or right. whatever. Uh, what is the biggest difference? Is Shiner Bach like a theme park version of a traditional yeah, Bach? Yeah, Shiner Bach is the Kraft Singles version of a Bach. Yeah, okay. You know, it's not really a Bach, it's more uh, Munich Vienna or Light. Vienna Lager. Yeah. But, but even then, like anything themed around something awesome is better than something not themed around it being awesome. Right, right. Yeah. Well, box tend to be really malty, kind of oh, sweet. Oh, my word. And these, this beer, the Doppelbach, was brewed by this brewery called Polliner originally, right? They brewed this Bach called Salvador. That beer was sort of used by the monks to help them get it through, get them through Lent, you oh, know? Oh yeah, because they used it to get all of their nutrients. They used it instead of eating. Yeah, and you know, it helped them sort of rain those days away with a little bit of sustenance. And because of that, they called it liquid bread. As we've talked about, first thing is you want to check out the color and all that stuff. Um, it's kind of red. Yeah, it's a rich brown with a red through. highlight. Wow, dark brown. The nose is extraordinarily earthy. Like oh, for some yeah. reason, the, the phrase horsehair popped into my mind. You ever have a dog who's been out in the sun or whatever mm -hmm. and you bury your face in the, no, just me? That's gross. <laughs> <laughs> Not to make it sound unappealing, but it smells like walking through the dog food aisle yeah, of a grocery yeah, store. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really okay, I'm glad I'm not alone. Which is all like wheat and grains and everything. But yeah. it also has some caramelized sugar yeah. to it. As if you're making candy and the sugar burned to the pan a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, yeah. 
How pretentious do they think we are right now? Oh, super. <laughs> right? I mean, super pompous. Do we just need to do a disclaimer? No. It's just beer. Yeah. yeah. You know, you could talk all that stuff or you could just drink this beer because it's delicious. <laughs> This style of beer has been brewed since the 1630s. Wow. Yeah, it's an older style and it's fabulous. It still. tastes very thick. Mm -hmm. Such a good bite to it. Yeah. You got that hoppy bite at the end. The mouthfeel is is like a almost a whipped cream kind of thing. You oh, keep sure. using this word mouthfeel. Uh, oh. It's the way it feels in your mouth. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you eat cherries, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of fruity and juicy and awesome, but when you eat a grape, the skin sort of saps the moisture out of your mouth. Oh, sure. So that's a very good way to sort of demonstrate mouthfeel, okay. is the differences between those two things. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is Andex Double Buck, and it's a fabulous beer. Okay, but the important thing is that when I go to a bar that has a wide variety, uh, Double Bock, I should know, means... Uh, Double Bock just means a strong Bock. And there are a lot of them made out there right now. How like strong I said, is it ABV? ABV, they, this one's 7.1. Oh. Oh, that explains they a little range, bit. They range High. from 7 to 10%. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. And if you ever want to go harder than this, there's another beer called Eisbach, E-I-S Bach, which is a Doppelbach or a single Bach that they freeze and then scrape the ice off of, which enhances all the flavors and alcohol yeah. of whatever's left over. And sometimes they'll do that a couple of times. So you'll get ice box that are like 9% to 14%. All right, we can't thank you guys enough. Uh, Thebeerists.com? Yes. And their Patreon, patreon.com forward slash thebeerists. Speaking of Correct. Patreon, you know who else has a Patreon? We do. Split it up. Do it to both of us. Yeah, no, come on. Uh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Split it up, you put it together. Okay, put it together and give us yeah. both money. Oh Is that what you're going for? Just search for the beers and subscribe to us. All right, yeah. I'm gonna search for this double buck. <laughs> How about a beer again? This happens a lot. <laughs> Bryce is very excited. Later, goes on. Oh, I think it's later. I have to say, okay. Oh!